Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In his short work on controlling anger, Plutarch is going to place into the mouth of the main interlocutor, Fundandus, this idea that we need to train ourselves away from anger. And he's rather realistic about this. He doesn't expect that we're going to train ourselves to the point that we never feel anger at all or give in to it a little. But it's important to think of this as an ongoing process that involves changing not just our ideas and outlook and behavior, but also our habits, our way of being in the world. And pretty late in the, the discussion, he says that it's true that all of the passions, all of the emotions, need a process of habituation, an ethismos, right? Which ethe is, is the Greek term for habit. So ethismos, this process of cultivating or uh, you could say taking away habits that we have. And he says, it tames as it were and subdues by training. And that's another key term, ascasis. Uh, the word that we get ascetic from, ascasis means training, the kind of thing that you would do by going to the gym or by deliberately engaging in philosophical practices. So anger, like all of the other emotions, is going to require this. And for Plutarch, why is this the case? Well, he is a middle Platonist, which means that he accepts the Platonic a division of the soul into rational and irrational parts, and the irrational parts are multiple. And so he says that um, this trains the irrational, the alogon, and the obstinate, or the more literally unwilling to listen, the uh, deus pathes part of the soul. So this is very important. We all have this part of our personality or soul. And it's by the time we start looking at it, uh, it's already in some bad shape uh, from the perspective of, of uh, our emotions. So we need to attend to that and start working on it, start fixing it. And this is going to take time. Now, earlier on in the work, actually at the very beginning of his um, discussion, when, when his friend has complimented him and saying, wow, you used to be such an angry person. How did you change? How did you become less angry? He says, well, you know, I started doing things different in my condition. And he, he t starts talking about reason and anger, logos, the part of us that does the thinking, right? Which, again, from the Platonic perspective, uh, should be the part in charge, oftentimes isn't the irrational and obstinate part will often be in charge. And reason is understood here in a number of different interesting ways. There's some metaphors going on here. And Fundanus is going to say, I don't think reason should be used in one's cure as we use hell bore and be washed out of the body together with the disease. And he, he'll go on and he say, it's not like a drug, right? You don't, you don't take it, the reason, meaning the reasonable precepts or things like that, and then you're good and you go back to living your irrational life. No, reason needs to be something more like, he says, good food that we take in and digest and make part of ourselves, which implies that we could be more or less rational or reasonable, that we can make reason 
build within ourselves. And we can also listen to the reasonable advice, precepts of other people as well. So he says it has to remain in the soul and keep watch and ward over the judgments, the crises. And this is an important term that we're going to see coming up a little bit later. Our judgments are often what get us into trouble, right? So reason has to pay attention to them. And the more our reason is developed, the better we're going to be at that. So he says that the power of reason can, you know, be in great vigor in those who become accustomed to it. But when other people give us advice, even if it is reasonable, if they're applied to the passions when they're at their height and swollen, they can't do much at all unless we've actually sort of prepared ourselves with it, right? And he, he says that, you know, anger can be particularly difficult because the other passions will, in fact, listen to reason when it comes from without somebody else to the rescue, but temper doesn't, right? <laughs> because uh, unless we've actually prepared the ground, when we're being irrationally angry and somebody points that out to us or they give us some advice, we get angry at them as well. We don't want to hear it, right? And this is a common feature of anger. So what can we do? Well, anger, the danger here is that it's going to push reason completely out. Uh, it's actually this great ex oikias, right? Kicking somebody out of the house saying, get the hell out of here, right? This is my place. So a anger will do that to us. And he says it shuts out this completely and locks it out, just like those who burn themselves up in their own homes. It makes everything within full of confusion and smoke and noise so that the soul can either hear nor see anything that might help it. And then he's got another very interesting uh, comparison here. He says that a, a ship that's in trouble, right? A ship that is deserted by her crew in the midst of a storm far out at sea, it could take on a pilot from the outside, somebody who could steer the ship, but only if it's ready to do that sort of thing. He says a ship will, will take on a pilot more easily than a man being tossed on the billows of passion and anger, thumo kai orge, right? Two words that are used for anger by uh, Plutarch here. Uh, the person who's being tossed on these will hardly admit the reasoning of another unless he has his own powers of reason prepared to receive it. So how do we, in fact, prepare our capacity, our power, our faculty of reason to be able to take on advice coming from the outside? Well, we have to fortify it ahead of time. So he says, just like those who are expecting a siege, right, to be under attack for a long time, collect up and store all that's useful to them. So it's most important we acquire in advance the reinforcements, boethemata, um, you know, literally the running to the aid things or the running to the aid people. We need to have, you could, you could say, our head stocked up with the things that are going to help us against anger ahead of time. And he says that philosophy provides these against anger and... We need to convey them into the soul in the knowledge that when the occasion for using them comes, it is not going to be possible to introduce them easily. We need them there already. So we need to do our anger management before we actually start getting angry so that when we are, in fact, feeling anger, we've already got some, some plans, some reinforcements, some techniques in place that will allow us to, to do that. Um, now, there's a number of ways he talks about doing this in the work. We're going to come to a few of them here. But before that, he also talks about this uh, danger. When anger, he says, persists and its outbursts are frequent, then there is created in the soul a bad state, a, uh, he calls it 
poneron, something, something wicked, something bad within the soul that we call irascibility uh, in Greek, um, orgilotes, right? So orge is the word for anger itself, the feeling that we feel. Orgilotes is this disposition to feel anger excessively, too quickly, at the wrong targets for the wrong reason. It's a angerability, you could say, right? It, a liability to become angry. When we say that somebody has anger problems, that is a contemporary word for this irascibility that Plutarch is concerned about. And he says that, you know, once you've got this, this results in sudden outbursts of rage and um, being, you know, difficult, uh, being bitter, picrian, right? And being uh, peevish, duscolian, right? These, these things uh, result. And um, when the temper becomes, he says, ulcerated, easily offended, liable to find fault for even trivial offenses, like a weak piece of iron, which is always getting scratched. So if we get angry over and over and over again, and again, we often realize this after <laughs> this has actually happened to us, we wind up in this state, which is going to be, um, you know, we're more vulnerable to, to becoming angry. So what can we do then? Well, once again, we see this term judgment, crisis, right? We need judgment, uh, which can oppose these fits of anger. So judgment opposes it by saying the right thing to do in this case is I'm getting angry. Okay, I need to do something about this. You know, I need to like not, I can be angry, but not act on the anger. Don't say anything. Being silent is actually one of the techniques that gets discussed. And he says that this will change our condition, not just in the present, but for the future. We're modifying our habits. We're training ourselves to approach things differently. And at first, it seems like it's not going to work at all. And then he says something really quite interesting here. He says, in my own case, at any rate, when I had opposed anger two or three times, it came about that I experienced what the Thebans do when they had for the first time repulsed the Spartans who had the reputation of being invincible, were never uh, thereafter defeated by them in battle. What's he talking about there? Well, so the Spartans were the badasses of ancient Greece for a very, very long time. If the Spartans came on the field, you'd be like, ah, oh, we can fight, but we're going to lose, you know, because it's look at it, it's the Spartans right there, right? So in land warfare, at least that was the case. Not so great in naval warfare. And who beat them? Well, the sacred band of Thebes. Thebes is a, a city far north of Athens, and they became a regional power, and they fought the Spartans, and they kicked the Spartans' asses. So the ass kickers got their asses kicked. And then once that happens, everyone else is like, oh, wait a second. The Spartans, they're not as tough as we think. We, we can beat them, right? And the Thebans were like, we already did beat them. We can beat them again. Well, it's that way with anger. It seems invincible until we start changing our habits, until we start engaging in some training, stocking ourselves up with the resources of philosophy. And then we discover, oh, no, I actually can beat anger. And that's, that's what... Plutarch has his speaker, Fundana, saying, that's what happened to me. He said, not only did, did I see that anger ceases when cold water is sprinkled on it, as Aristotle says, but there's other ways to do it as well. A poultice, uh, so a poultice is like, you know, a uh, bandage or something like that to cure you of fear. We can use other passions. Fear can drive out anger. We can be like, hey, i I'm worried about what I'm going to do when I'm angry. I don't want to offend these people. I don't want to ruin this business deal. I don't want to uh, destroy my relationship with my significant other or my parents or my kids or my friends. Therefore, I'd better not allow the anger to run away with me. Or another very interesting emotion that he's going to talk about a little bit later um, in terms of like laughing and stuff like that. Joy, charis or chara here. And Joy, being joyful, can actually make us lose that feeling of anger, right? So that's, that's quite good as well. And he says, I came to the opinion this passion is not altogether incurable. 
uh, at least for those who wish to cure it. And then he goes into one last really important point. He says, anger does not always have great and powerful beginnings. If we are irascible types, if we're not in control of our anger, even a joke, a playful word, a burst of laughter, a nod on the part of somebody, rouse people to anger, right? And he gives you a few examples. And then he says, so when it's at the start, when it's a small thing, it's sort of like kindling in a campfire, right? He uses the example of kindling a flame in rabbit's fur, which I guess maybe was something that they did in ancient times, or candle wicks or rubbish. Um, if you stop the flame when it's first forming, it's not going to take hold and then start spreading and all of that. So what you have to do is extinguish the, the flame of temper or anger early on. And if you can do that, well, then you're not going to have to struggle quite as much. So what would tell you to do that? Again, reason. The irrational part of yourself is not going to tell you to do that. We have to cultivate our faculty of reason and do so in very clear and determinate ways that will then allow us to keep our anger under control and train ourselves away from suffering from it.